Shalom, everyone. And the Nazarim, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. Shalom, everyone. My name is Lou White, and we're, uh, we're here to talk about witchcraft today. And it's hiding in, it's hiding in the light, actually. But uh, we want to invite Yahusha Hamashiach to be in our midst, to be the, the voice that we're listening to. And his words are behind all the scripture that we're going to be showing you today. And uh, we want him to know that we love him above all else. And that's the reason that we're here. We're his servants. And the terminology that we're going to be using today, for those of you that may not be familiar with each term, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is the screen that shows you the names or the words that we're going to be using. Uh, for example, L-O-R-D, we're not going to use that because that's an English word. So we're going to use the actual Hebrew name of the, of the creator of the universe so that there's not going to be any trickery done, you know, where the adversary steps in and just steals something away from us, like a seed that's really important. Yahuwah is the way we pronounce it. Some use a W, but we're going to just spell it in the simplest possible way with just the, the, the U. And the name of the Messiah, which he, he said he is the way and the truth and the life. So he's related to the tree of life, and is the tree of life. He's the living word, the Torah, which we're going to explain a little further down the line too. The word Torah is a Hebrew word that means instruction. And we're going to be using these words, and those of you that are watching this on YouTube or the internet or on a DVD can study what this chart is saying. And don't get real upset about the spelling. You know, the spelling of your preference is fine. Nazarim is what we're called and that's according to a prophecy in Yermiyahu or Jeremiah 31, verse 6. Not serene. Watchmen, guardians, and we were named by a, an enemy that was accusing Paul called Tertullus. At Acts 24, verse 5, he identified him as a ringleader of the sect of the not serene. Not serene. Branches of the teachings of Yahushua. Anyway, we're the uh, branches. He's the head. Israel is a corporate body and he's the head of that body so he is part of Israel see not the state of Israel but the nation of Israel throughout and the tribes throughout the earth through all time now we're going to start with the uh, the actual living words themselves the ones that were handed down intact the first and this is part of the restoration too for the scattered tribes of Israel in the last days if you read Deuteronomy chapter 4 and 5 and 6 as a continuous thread. Number one, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin. For Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Number four, guard the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day, not a Sabbath, to set it apart 
as Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work. You nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your ox nor your donkey nor any of your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. That's a covenant sign, by the way. Ezekiel 20. Number five, respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number ten, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Those are ten words. The Aseret Hadabarim is what it is called in Hebrew, the ten words. And, uh, un well, we have a problem with the fact that through time, the adversary changed this covenant and wiped out the second commandment about bowing to idols and turned the tenth one into two. That's why the Catholics think the third commandment is about the Sabbath because they wiped out, you know, the second commandment. Hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one, and you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being and all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart and you shall impress them on your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That was, you know, the, if you read chapters four, five and six together, this is what we're, what we're dealing with here. It's very important. Now, we, we mentioned the way and the truth and the life. In the Garden of Eden, there was a tree of knowledge of good and evil that we were not to eat from. And that is the tree of religion. That's the tree where we decide what we want to do. And that's the tree, we're going to call it witchcraft. We're going to call it sorcery. We're going to, we're going to call it denominational religion. It's the darkness hiding in open view. And it's concealing itself. It's masquerading. And the deceiver was there to deceive right there in the beginning. And they were free to eat from the tree of life, which was actually the word of Yahuwah, the living words. But instead, they chose to listen to the deceiver who was masquerading as a messenger of light. And they ate from the wrong tree. Now, this investigation into sorcery or witchcraft, in the Hebrew, it's kashaf is going to lead to the hidden place that it's actually found to hide. It's identified by a name. Actually, there's a name given to this sorcery. It's a sorceress's name. It's C-I-R-C-E. We're going to call it Sea Girl over here. Sea Girl is mentioned as a woman. And um, it, this woman makes the nations drunk on the wine, the abominations, and a golden cup. Revelation 17, 18 says, And the woman whom you saw is that great city having sovereignty over the sovereigns of the earth. Psalm 16, 4 says, The sorrows of those who run after another one are increased. I would not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor take up their names on my lips. That's why I'm calling it Sea Girl. I'm not saying the real name. Remember Exodus 23, 13 because we're not supposed to take the names of other Elohim on our lips. And that's what Psalm 16 also refers to. But notice that the word drink offerings is in here too. We're going to deal with that later on. Now, the word C-H-U-R-C-H -H is derived from this sorceress's name. And a lot of people don't realize that, but that's what, that's what the facts are. 
And it, it really entered in in the King James Version, and uh, that's where we actually inherited it. It's not that old in the translations. The translators like Tyndale and Wycliffe, who were the first, Wycliffe was the first one to translate into English, and he chose the word congregation from the Greek ekklesia. Now, congregation is what it's talking about. It's not talking about a, a, a hierarchy over us like Nicolaitans. Now, now, the first mention of enchanters, enchanters are people who chant. You know, they have enchantment spells. They spiel out words. The first mention is in Exodus 7, verse, starting at verse 10. So Moshe and Aharon went into Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh was like all the world leaders behind him, and even into the current day, who have sorcerers around them. Now, this is going to be weird because you don't think you've seen a lot of sorcery going on in government. But that's what was happening then, and it's still going on. I'm going to show you that. They, anyway, they went into Pharaoh, and they did so as Yahuwah commanded. And Aharon threw his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men, who were sorcerers, and the practicers of sorcery or witchcraft, and they, the magicians of Mitzrayim, also did so with their magic, their sorcery changed their rods into the serpents. And they, each one, threw down his rod. But the rod of Aharon swallowed up their rods. Sorcery is a lot of different things. In, in the darkness, we see the obvious stuff like scrying, divination, communication with forces, the witch, this woman riding the beast. And anyway, the Hebrew word is Kashaf, and it means to whisper a spell, to say something, to bend the forces, which are really the fallen Malachim or the messengers of, Yehush, of, of uh, the messengers of Hashatan, that they're communicating with demons, and the demons manifest what their requests are, are asking for. Anyway, I've put this word. C-I-R-C-E, prominently there on display so that you can identify anything that calls itself by this name or any derivative of this name is a source of sorcery, a source of sorcery, a source of sorcery, a source of sorcery, a source of sorcery. Anything that calls itself by this name or any derivative of this name is a source of sorcery. Now, uh, the scheme of the devil is to hide witchcraft or sorcery in plain view so that you become conditioned to it and you think, oh, isn't that nice? That's beautiful. Well, here's uh, the image of the beast that was shown to uh, Daniel's little buddies that they had to bow down to. This is an image of the beast. And it was a pillar that was put up at the entrances, as you all know, and from watching the other seminars on the image of the beast in the entrances of the pagan temples. Now, right there in the middle of the picture here, we see another image of the beast. It's the same thing. It's a cone of power, and it's the same thing. It's not pointing to heaven. It's actually something completely different from what you know. Because you see there's two levels of interpretation in, the, in sorcery. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. They interpret things completely different from what the masses do. And here we have the image of the beast over here, which is really a shock to some people who are hearing this for the first time. The image of Tammuz is at the top, and the image, you know, of the beast that's, uh, you know, the same thing. You're looking at the form of the beast here, which is a physical form. The obelisk and the cone of power and the image of jealousy. This image of jealousy over here that we call a steeple is actually the thing that was shown to Ezekiel in chapter 8. Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 6 starts out saying, And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations which the house of Israel are doing here, driving me away from my set-apart place? Are you, and, and you are to see still greater abominations. Most of those that are in rebellion are just simply deceived. Those deceived will be surprised and they'll marvel at the beast whose names are not written in the scroll of life. Revelation 17 talks about this. The beast that you saw was and is not 
and is about to come up out of the pit of the deep and goes to destruction. And those dwelling on the earth whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world shall marvel when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind having wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now the woman is C-H-U-R-C-H. That's a pretty scary thing to think about. Now, our attention is misdirected by the superficial or the common view of the origins of witchcraft. Because you see, there's a misdirection going on. People are saying, well, that's obviously witchcraft. But they don't know where the real thing is operating at. Now, we call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans, and there's other names for them. But here's, here's a quote from an online Celtic Connection question and answer page. As a solitary, you are free to choose any path you desire. You are free to choose any path you desire or any blend that feels right to you. The important thing is to not allow a name or word to become a stumbling block. It is the intent of your actions and the spirituality that matters in the end. Ultimately, you must do what feels right to you. That's what they go by. Now, here's the primary rule among the Wiccans. Harm none and do as you will. Now, that's contrasted with Deuteronomy 12, verse 8. Do not do as we are doing here today, each one doing whatever is right in his own eyes. That's interesting. To decide for yourself what you accept means that you worship yourself and that you're putting yourself above the creator, and that's humanism or a form of it. Now, divination or sorcery is forbidden. Some people get a tray of chicken bones and they shake them they throw them and they look at them it's like reading somebody's palm and looking at the wrinkles and in, in the palm of the flesh and saying this means something and they have they chart all this stuff out and they diagram it and uh, the same thing's done with astrology you know like when this thing happens and that thing gets lined up with this then something's going to happen or something's not going to happen whatever deuteronomy 18 specifically says, let no one be found among you who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire or one who practices divination or a user of magic, that's sorcery, or one who interprets omens like chicken bones or palms or a sorcerer or one who conjures spells or medium or spiritist or one who calls up the dead. We don't pray to the saints. We pray for the saints. Okay, now that's a concept. For whoever does these are an abomination to Yahuwah. And because of these abominations, Yahuwah, your Elohim, drives them out from before you. Be perfect before Yahuwah, your Elohim. For these nations whom you are possessing do listen to those using magic and to diviners. But as for you, Yahuwah, your Elohim, has not appointed such for you. So don't do any of those things. You know, there's things over here going on and there's images here and objects and signing your body with crucs. Uh, it's, it's magician stuff, you know, it's masquerading. Now the Hebrew word for a witch or a sorcerer is kashaf. And it means to whisper a spell. That is to enchant or practice magic. And Exodus 22 says, do not even allow, or do not allow, a practicer of witchcraft to live. Of course, the word witchcraft there is the word kashaf. A person who practices such things is an abomination. And uh, oddly enough, even the Eastern religions realize that they're praying to a force. That's what the Star Wars thing was about, the, the force. And the force they're talking about is the thing that they're trying to yoke with. That's what the word yoga means, to yoke with the force. But it's actually demons. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 says, See to it that no one makes you a prey through philosophy, or makes a prey of you through philosophy, and empty deceit according to the tradition of men. 
according to the elementary matters of the world and not according to the Messiah. So anyway, all magicians deceive through misdirection. Now the greatest magician in the whole universe is Hashatan or Satan. He's the magician behind all the magicians. He's trying to misdirect people and he masquerades as a messenger of light. Witchcraft is hiding in a form that few people suspect it to be hiding. They're watching for it elsewhere. See, Satan's got this game going on saying, look, at, look over here. You see that? That's witchcraft. And it's obvious. But where he's really doing the trick, he's not showing you. Just like a magician will show you, look over here. But he's doing the trick somewhere else. You get this? Misdirection. The dragon servant, ser servants are masquerading as messengers of light. They dress up in costumes, in masquerade costumes. Hashatan works to misdirect and openly deceive. He's a magician. As Shaul ravaged the Nazarim, he was out ravaging them. He was arresting them everywhere he could find them and dragging them back to the Sanhedrin where they were being stoned to death. Philip and Kepha went to Samaria, which is Shomeron, and it was in northern Israel, you know, where the t ten tribes were at, uh, where they used to be anyway. And this fellow named Simon Magus, which means Simon the magician, the sorcerer, attempted to pay for the power to lay hands on people so that they might receive the Ruach HaKodesh. The Ruach HaKodesh is the spirit, the set-apart spirit. Now, sorcery in Simon is shown here in Acts chapter 8. Now there was a certain man called Shimon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Shomeron, people in Samaria, claiming to be someone great to whom they, are, they, they were all giving heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this one is the power of Elohim, which is great. And they were giving heed to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his sorcery, his magic. Anyway, the, the thing that's walking in our midst, in, even among the Nazarim, there are magicians that are masquerading. Now, in 2 Corinthians 11, we have uh, the city of Corinth, of course, is where we're, where we're at. And Paul, or Shaul, Paul is talking to them in a letter, and he says, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as a messenger of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So where did it all begin? Where, when did the deception, or where did it originate? Well, it, it's pretty obvious that it was the fall of mankind. That was what we were talking about, the tree of, of, of the tree of life, the way, the truth, and the life, which is Yahushua in the garden. And then we have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is the tree that the adversary wanted them to eat from, which is what we call religion. You know, It's poison doctrine introduced by the dragon. It's the wrong tree and it's the wrong fruit. Now, Gen Gen uh, Genesis 3 describes the situation perfectly. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall certainly not die. That's the first lie. For Elohim knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes shall be opened and you shall be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. And she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her and he ate. The dragon uses religion to control the world now through that fall. Now, the tree of life is a fig tree. Its head is Yahusha, and its body is the nations of Israel. And they're in the world. They're supposed to be operating as that tree that the nations go to, to eat the fruit of it. And that fruit is supposed to be his Torah that we read at the very beginning. That's what we're supposed to be teaching people. That's why I never fail to leave it out, because it's the most important thing that we have to say. The rest of this is all, you know, basically underneath that, because this is the, just the way that you're deceived. And uh, I'm going to use some of these uh, pictures to illustrate the uh, apple is not really probably the fruit of the tree that they ate from. But if you eat the teachings of the religions 
to, to see he he tries to be like Yahuwah, but he changes it a little bit. You know, like the when the Catholics changed the Ten Commandments, they just took one out and made the other, one of them into two. See, that's a doctrine, and if you eat that, it's poison. See, if you're eating 99% healthy stuff and then you have 1% poison in it, you're dead. And it's like transgenic fruit. It's the, it's not really fruit. It looks like fruit. Animals go buy transgenic fruit to get to the real stuff. They'll just pass it up, even if you starve them. Religion is the poison that put, put us to sleep in the first place. Like Snow White, all mankind has been beguiled and fell asleep long ago from eating bad fruit that was beguiled. It was uh, enchanted. It was, a spell was cast over it by the great magician. And, it, and we're awaiting a prince that will awaken us. And that prince, of course, is the way, the truth, and the life, Yahushua, or Yahushua. And he opens his, our eyes to reality, not a religion. Yahushua is able to break through the enchantment right now with truth. Receive love for the word of Yahuwah and you wake up. Because it's like everybody's asleep. What is witchcraft? Well, it's, ultimately it's rebellion. And we learn that from the words of a prophet named Shemuel or Samuel. And he was a, a prophet of Yahuwah that was living during the days of the first king of Israel, whose name was Shaul. Shaul was the first king. The second king was Daud or David. The prophet Shemuel told Shaul in 1 Samuel 15, for rebellion is as the sin of divination. And stubbornness is as wickedness and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Yahuwah, he also does reject you as sovereign. So magic has a source of power. That's what the witches go for. They're looking for the force. You know, they worship C-I-R-C-E, believe it or not. So witchcraft hides itself in religion and philosophy and even science and quaint customs to appear innocent. The whole world is openly bombarded with books, movies, and TV programs that glamorize this rebellious worship of the universal force. It's demonic Malachim. It's their demons. That's what the force is. Now, even the Merlin TV show is uh, glamorizing it, and it promotes magic as potentially good. They have a dragon in there and a cave, and Merlin is uh, this young boy. Anyway... The government has always consulted their mediums all through time. Remember Pharaoh? He had his mediums right there with him when he was confronting the men of Yahuwah. Now, Shaul was the, the king of Israel at the time that Shemuel was there. And sh at some point, Shemuel died. The prophet died. And Sha Shaul was still running around trying to figure out what he should do. And he was going to fight the Philistines one day. And he said, well... I'm not hearing anything from Yahuwah. Yahuwah had departed from this king. So he decides to go seek out a witch, a kashaf, named, well, we just know her, name, know her as the witch of Endor. Anyway, at first she thought Paul was, or Shaul was trying to set, set her up because he'd been out exterminating witches too. But anyway, she's a conjurer. And the word used in the text is yid, yidoine, the, Shaul's name, by the way, is interesting because it means one who asks, you know. Now, the word occult actually uh, comes from the, the idea that they're hidden. You know, something is hiding in the shadows. Now, there's a, an illustration of the witch of Endor and the prophet Shemuel or Samuel. And there's uh, King Shaul with two of his little buddies there. Anyway, in Isaiah 44, we read more about this topic. Thus said Yahuwah, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am Yahuwah, doing all, stretching out the heavens all alone, spreading out the earth with none beside me, frustrating the signs of the babblers and driving diviners mad, turning wise men backwards and making their knowledge foolish. Confirming the word of his servant and completing the counsel of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, be inhabited, and of the cities of Yehuda, they shall be built, and her ruins raised up by me. There was a king 
I believe uh, the king was named uh, Balak. And he hired a, pro, a, a sorcerer named Balaam. And he was paid the wages of a sorcerer. If you read Numbers 22, you'll hear about that. So uh, it, there, there is another example of a king, a government, using sorcery. Entry points that lure unsuspecting followers into this stuff. New Age promotions are really the old religion masquerading as something progressive and new. Sometimes they even mix it with science. Sometimes they get electricity involved and little gizmos, you know, like Scientology. Hold on to these things. And anyway, that'll get your uh, soul cleansed. Now, some of the things that we call it is uh, fringe science, necromancy, fairies, Ouija boards, seances, drug sor sorcery, and aura reading. That was real popular back in the 60s, most of these things. Now, it, it really started with uh, Arthur Conan Doyle back in the later part of the 1800s. You know, spiritism, all this stuff. Examples of deeply rooted forms of witchcraft are these. You know, they're deeply rooted witchcraft. They're forms of witchcraft. And people are not even aware of what they're doing. Popular holidays. Trees. Wreaths. Colored eggs, birthdays, cakes with candles, wishing wells or pools that you throw coins in, and wedding rings. Wedding rings. <laughs> it's Roman, and it has to do with V-E-N-U-S. Well, in Jer Yermiyahu Yermi or Jeremiah 10, we read these words. Thus said you who do not learn the way of the Gentiles, and do not be awed by the signs of the heavens, for the Gentiles are awed by them. For the prescribed customs of these people are worthless. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. They adorn it with silver and gold, and they fasten it with nails and hammers so that it does not to topple. They are like a rounded post, and they do not speak. They have to be carried because they do not walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they do no evil, nor is it in them to do any good. There is none like you, O Yahuwah. You are great, and great is your name in might. Who would not fear you, O sovereign of the nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise men of the nations, and in all of their reigns, there is none like you. They are both brutish and foolish, and instruction of worthlessness is the tree. And it's an A-S-H-E-R-A-H is what it is. It was taught to us through the northern tribes of Israel after the, the witch taught them that. The witch, we're going to look at the witch here in a minute. Deuteronomy 7 says, And do not bring an abomination into your house, lest you be accursed like it. Utterly loathe it and utterly hate it, for it is accursed. Now, it's the abomination of the Sidonians. The Sidonians. It was a little city called Sidon or Sidon up in northern, the northern coast area of the land of Israel. And Tyre was up there too. Tyrians and Sidonians were, were heathens. And uh, we're going to look at something here in just a, a couple of frames here. Now in 1 Kings, and Shlomo or Solomon went after the A-S-T-H-O-R-E-T-H. That's the same thing. It's a tree. And the mighty one of the Sidonians. And after M-I-L-K-O-M, the abomination of the Ammonites. That's uh, pretty, pretty bad. Thus Shlomo did evil in the, sight, in the eyes of Yahuwah and did not follow Yahuwah completely like his father Daud. A-S-H-E-R-I-M were trees. And the people of Sidon taught Israel this abomination. Now, this girl, we're going to call her I, the I-Z-E-B-E-L that married the man, the king of northern Israel, Ahab. We're going to call her Izzy Girl, just to keep from having to say her name, because her name means virgin of B-A-A-L. <laughs> anyway, Izzy Girl, the Sidonian princess married Ahab, and she, and she brought the worship of B-A-A-L and A-S-H-E-R-A-H into the hearts of the tribes of Samaria, Shomeroth the 10 northern tribes. Here's the tree over there with that little elf. Actually, he's not a little guy anymore. They made him big with Coca-Cola's promotion. And there's the wreath. 
And that's a phallus and this is a womb. I mean, that's what they are. See, there's two levels of interpretation. I'm going to show you that in a minute. You're going to get a kick out of it. And here's a, an illustration of Izzy Girl and Ahab. She was a witch, and she married the king of the northern tribes. Ahab was the son of Omri. Omri was the guy that built the city of Samaria. And Izzy Girl was the daughter of the king of Sidon. In 1 Kings 16, in the 38th year of Asa, the sovereign of Yehuda, Ahab of Omri became sovereign over Israel. That would mean that when Asa, the sovereign of the, of the lower tribes, the, the southern tribes, when he was king, well, in the 38th year of his kingship, this Ahab fellow became the sovereign over the northern tribes. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Yisrael and Shomeron 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the eyes of Yahuwah more than all those before him. And it came to be as, as though it had been, done, been a light matter for him to walk in the, in the sins of Yerobam, the son of Nabat, that he took as wife Izzy girl, the Sidonian princess. In other words, he was already pretty bad, but then he did something even worse. He married this witch, okay? The daughter of Fbaal, the sovereign of the Sidonians. And during their lifetime, they were uh, agitated by a fellow, by a Tishbite by the name of Eliyahu. Remember him? Eliyahu? Anyway, I Izzy Girl's witchcraft eventually expanded like yeast throughout the whole world, becoming C-H-U-R-C-H. <laughs> You'll see that in just a few moments. And he says, dude, you're married to a witch. They didn't like that. And, the, and so he became their enemy. Now, these are forms of witchcraft, and it's hard to believe, but we're programmed with this stuff from children. Because you, you, you see that's all geared and aimed at the children. You've got the wreath of the bunny rabbit and the, and the witch riding the broom and the tree. And you've got yoga. You've got the basket with eggs in it. You've got the wedding rings. You've got crossing your fingers. All of these things. Totem poles, obelisks, you know, and there's pumpkins. Well, a lot of Christians are aware that Halloween is a problem, you know. But they don't really know about the cone hats and the birthday cakes and the making wishes to genies. They don't really think about that, you know. But um, divination and necromancy, that's uh, basically what people are doing with these boards that are actually guided by spirits, the fallen spirits. And in the French, we means yes. And in German, ja means yes. So it's Ouija, you know. Anyway, it's a term that refers to the belief of a person that he or she can communicate to the dead or the other side. And this can be done by using this Ouija board, yes, yes board. And this board is also known as the talking board or the spirit board. Just one form of witchcraft, sorcery, necromancy, you know, communicating with the dead. Romans 1.28 starts out saying, and even as they did not think it worthwhile to possess the knowledge of Elohim, Elohim gave them over to a worthless mind to do what is improper having been filled with all unrighteousness, whoring, wickedness, greed, evil, filled with envy and murder, fighting, deceit, evil habits, whisperers, slanderers, haters of Elohim, insolent, proud boasters, divisors of evils, disobedient to parents, without discernment, covenant breakers, unloving, unforgiving, ruthless, who, though they know the righteousness of Elohim, that those who practice such deserve death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So when you hear a president stand up and defend homosexuality, you know, and they're all going, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, that might not be good. <laughs> well, that's just one example, you know. But uh, manipulation of forces is direct interaction with fallen Malachim, you know, the demonic realm. That's what it really is. This is a fun picture. There's two levels in the occult. There's interpretation, you know. There's one that's exoteric, and it has an outward meaning, and it's familiar to most people. Exoteric. It's, 
it's an t- interpretation. When you look at it, you see it, and you, and you interpret it a certain way. Like when you look at a Christmas tree, you see the ornaments, and you go, oh, isn't that pretty? Well, the ornaments actually have a meaning, you know, and some of you all know what that is, and you can find that out. And the, and the other level is esoteric, and it is only a, a, a meaning known that's hidden to the masses, and it's only known to the initiated, the ones that are, the initiated are the ones that are on the inside, the ones that actually have the information. Well, oddly enough, you guys are being equipped so you see both sides, so that you can stay away from bo- both of them, you know. And uh, stay away from outhouses like this. This isn't good. There's Al Gore again and George Soros. Now, there's an invisible war going on, and it's going to continue on. The war in heaven, as they call it. And it'll go on until Yahushua actually returns and binds the demons and Satan. Colossians 1 describes this war. Because in him were created all that are in the heavens and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or rulerships or principalities or authorities. All have been created through him and for him. So we know that they exist. And Ephesians 6 describes that we have to have defenses against the fallen ones. Put on the complete armor of Elohim for you to have power to stand against the schemes of the devil. See, we're, we're revealing schemes here. Because you do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against authorities, against the world rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual matters of wickedness in the heavenlies. Some of these schemes, some of them, include these things. The astrology charts, you know, masonry, palmistry, tarot card reading, you know. People walk into stores and they say, do you sell tarot cards? (laughs) And I say, well, that's divination. Have you read Deuteronomy chapter 18? Now, uh, one of the first B-I-B-L-E burnings that went on was a, the term B-I-B-L-E is actually the name of a pagan deity. Uh, the city of B-I-B-L-O-S was named that because the city of this fertility, I mean the city was named after the fertility deity, B-I-B-L-O-S or B-I-B-L-I-A. And her temple was in the city and parchments were known be- by the name of the city. So parchment was produced there and flax was grown nearby and they made the flax into these parchments and then paper as we know it what came to be known by this term that was actually a pagan deity's name the word is found in the scriptures and it's used here in acts 19 and many of those who had practiced magic brought their books which is the word b-i-b-l-e-s together and burned them before all And they reckoned up the value of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. Well, isn't that interesting? (laughs) So all these things were called by the same term that Christians use today for their scriptures. You know, the the Besorah, the message of Yahuwah. So this is a reason that I think witchcraft has reached in. And when we call things by things that, by names that are inappropriate, like calling Yahuwah's word by the name of a pagan deity, That might not be a good thing. It might be that somebody was behind that. Many of you all probably didn't know that. But it is a fact. You should look it up and, you know, test everything you hear. Now, here's an exhibit, exhibit A, actually, which is going to show you that the seven wonders of the ancient world were reflecting a lot of the things that pagans actually did to infiltrate the governments you know, uh, mankind's persistent monumental infatuation with sorcery and witchcraft. Uh, here we have a chart showing the pyramids of Egypt and the Colossus of Rhodes, uh, which was actually a statue of the sun deity, H-E-L-I-O-S. The lighthouse of Alexandria, the statue of Z-E-U-S at Olympia, the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, the temple of A-R-T-E-M-I-S at Ephesus, which is mentioned in the book of Acts. The hanging gardens of Babel, you know. Demonic schemes teach people how to rebel and look dignified as they do so. 
I mean, you can look dignified as you do, as you do your acts of rebellion. Let's look at that. Here's one form of rebellion. It's something that witchcraft used to use pools of water or they'd have a little table or a, a, some stones and then they'd have a pool of water and then they would, they would gaze into the pool. <laughs> and uh, scrying is what it's called. It's a name given to the ancient technique of gazing into an object such as a crystal ball or a bowl of water. Have you ever seen a gazing ball in somebody's lawn in their garden? Have you ever seen a, a little monument that looked like a little uh, obelisk and then at the top of it a real mirror ball? That's, that's a gazing ball too. So if you have one of those, you need to just get rid of it. Don't give it away. Throw it away. Bury it. Smash it. Now, when a crystal is used, scrying is known as crystal, crystal, crystallomancy. Using crystals in the divination of one's past, present, and future traditionally played a key role in the decision-making process of many powerful leaders throughout history. Nancy Reagan and her husband, she was the first lady of the then President Ronald Reagan, avidly used psychics to help plan her husband's domestic and foreign affairs. One of the earliest uses of crystals in scrying comes from the Druids, Scottish Highlanders termed these objects stones of power. And before, crystals scrying involved low-tech pools or bowls of water. Here's, here's a guy that's got one of the high-tech versions. It's a crystal ball, you know, instead of a pool of water, you know. So scrying is divination. Now, do governments actually use the occult? Well, yes, they do, and they always have. The first lady, Nancy Reagan, we mentioned before, was in daily contact with her astrologer, Joan Quigley. And when I looked this up on the internet, for some reason, my tea fell over. I don't know what that was about, but I just wanted to mention it. Phyllis was pretty shocked to hear about it. I didn't tell her, but anyway, she planned all the White House travel and press conferences. Not Nancy, Joan Quigley, okay? and came to be known as the Reagan's in-house astrologer and psychic. Astrologer, psychics, and mediums gained respect and new significance during Ronald Reagan's presidency. There was a, another uh, astrologer that, that predicted John Kennedy's death, and she became real popular during this time, too. Anyway, in Germany, there was a, an occultist, a clairvoyant, a mentalist. There's even a uh, so, uh, there's a TV series called The Mentalist. You probably have seen some of them. And, it, and he says, psychics aren't real. <laughs> well, Eric, John, Eric Jan Hannesen was a clairvoyant mentalist, occultist, and astrologer. And he was active in Weimar Republic, Germany, and at the beginning of Nazi Germany. Here's a picture of the fellow over here. They're having a seance. They've got their little fingers out there, you know. Anyway, that's a governmental high-level uh, occult action there. Now, this is really, really interesting. I have a lot of fun with Al Gore, and uh, if he were in the room, I would pay him respect, but here's some of the things that he's been involved in. He's worried about the resources of Mother Earth. Now, <laughs> Earth is not our mother, but anyway, in the worship of this mother, which is maybe related to the great mother, you know, of harlots. And a 1999 promotion of Al Gore, broadcaster Ted Turner, and the United Nations, U.S. taxpayers are actually being forced to subsidize a new form of state religion, which holds that natural resources have to be protected for the sake of GAIA, a so-called earth spirit. This religious movement is being promoted by leading figures and the organizations, such as Vice President Albert Gore and broadcaster Ted Turner and the United Nations. Gore has written openly about the earth having sacred qualities and has praised primitive pagan religions and G-O-D-D-E-S-S -S worship. Nostradamus was not a prophet of Yehua. He was a gazer. He was into gazing. Now the Brits... They used astrology against Hitler. 
Anyway, declassified files tell of Star Wars. Not only it wasn't you know the same Star Wars that we think of, it was uh, astrology wars. You know, Adolf Hitler worked closely with this clairvoyant that we mentioned earlier. You know, the publicist Eric Jan Hassen. Now here's more rebellion that's scientifically slanted. And today's scientific witchcraft is ripping open the fabric of space-time to breach to the other side. Forget the Ouija board. We're going to just rip it open with our, our beams and open it up. Who is teaching mankind to do these things? Well, who, what is the entity that's reaching through? You know, We have to question that. They're using hadron particles, super, conducting super colliders. And now they're going into transgenics and uh, transhumans. They're actually mixing DNA. Well, they've already been mixing DNA of various insects and plants and animals into, um, into, into pigs and, and monkeys and mosquito DNA with uh, fruits and vegetables. Governments fund, are funding experimental genetic modifications now, and that's rebellion. You see, when you're in rebellion, you're practicing witchcraft. Now, what does it say in Leviticus 19? Guard my laws. Do not let your livestock mate with another kind. Do not sow your field with mixed seed. And do not put a garment woven of two sorts of thread upon you. In other words, you don't want to mix your thread with wool, animal fur, and linen, which is a plant. So animals and plants are not to be mixed together. Anyway, we're doing it, you know. Daniel 9 says, O Master, to us is the shame of face, to our sovereigns, to our heads, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To Yahuwah our Elohim are the compassions and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. And we have not obeyed the voice of Yahuwah our Elohim to walk in his Torot, that's his instructions, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Transhuman genetic experimentation. Is that witchcraft? Is it sorcery? Absolutely, it's rebellion. Alchemy was the first step, and that led to chemistry and trying to get things to work the way we want to make them work. And science has already stepped through the doorway of genetic engineering. The tampering and meddling with actual DNA of plants and animals and mix them together. New fruits are being shown to you in the grocery. Like, well, what's that? You know, and like I said before, if you starve a rat and put a piece of this transgenic fruit right in his path and then put the real thing further down, he'll stop, he won't stop at the first one. He'll pass that right up and go straight to the real food. Cloning, GMOs, genetically modified organisms, gene therapy, People are taking gene therapy. We've got to fix you, you know. Genome projects, military applications for these things, like to build supermen. They're, they're actually discussing right now the blending of animals like spider DNA with people in order for them to be able to see better at night. And, you know, building the super soldier, you know. And uh, Genesis 6 says that Noah was perfect in his genetics. There was a tampering even before. So Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahuwah. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with Elohim. So he was, he was still undefiled by the bad genetic mixing that had been happening and producing the Nephilim and all the violence. Anyway, H plus is written up here. That, that stands for human plus, an enhanced human. And they think they're enhancing the human species by mixing them together with the genetics of other people. They're using, like I said, gene therapy, and they're also growing them and what we would call cloning. And when they talk about making new lines available you know, for these uh, genome projects, they're actually talking about growing full-size people, you know and growing meat uh, that do doesn't actually have a, a, a creature that it's on, but it just gr they just grow meat. 
The outcome for stumbling blocks and all things offensive. Here's the outcome. Matthew 13, coming from Yahushua's words. As the darnel, that's the weeds, then is gathered and burned in the fire, so it shall be at the end of this age. The son of Adam shall send out his messengers, and they shall gather out of his reign all the stumbling blocks and those doing lawlessness, and shall throw them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, and then the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the reign of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now here's an interesting thing, and a lot of people are going to have a little trouble with this one, but bear with me until we get through the whole thing, okay? This is about raising a toast. Now in the Hebrew word, the word for raising a toast is to lift up your voice and praise something or someone. And it's the Hebrew word shabach. And it's like, word up, dude. Anyway, here it is. It's a primitive root, and it properly means to address in a loud tone. In other words, everybody, let me hear, let me hear some quiet. Everybody quiet down now. We're going to tap your glass and lift up the wine, which is the blood of the grape. It's to, to commend or give esteem to or to praise, you know. And uh, we're going to look at when this happened one time. Daniel 5, Bel, uh, B-E-L, Chasser, the sovereign made a, a great feast for a thousand of his great men and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While tasting the wine, this fellow gave orders. I don't want to pronounce his name. It means something bad. He gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the Hekel, that's the temple of Yahuwah, which had been in Jerusalem, that the sovereign and his great men and his wives and his concubines should drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that they had taken from the Hekel of the house of Elah, that's the house of Yahuwah, which had been in Jerusalem. And the sovereign and his great men, his wives and his concubines drank out of them. They drank wine and praised, that's the word Shabbat, the Elohim of gold and of silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. At that moment, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the sovereign's palace. And the sovereign saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the sovereign's color changed. His thoughts alarmed him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. Okay? The king and his great men toasted with Yahuwah's vessels. And, and then his reign was toast after that. <clears throat> now, one lesson to be learned is when you're performing witchcraft... Never use Yahuwah's stuff to do it with. <laughs> anyway, if you want some more knee-knocking horror, listen to the Psalm 46 being read on the internet at the 9-11 ceremony. Oh, boy. Anyway, if you're not yet convicted, okay, watch this. The International Handbook on Alcohol and Culture says this. Toasting is a secular vestige of ancient sacrificial libations in which a sacred liquid was offered to the G.O.D.s. Blood or wine in exchange for a wish, a prayer summarized in the words, Long life to your health. We must praise Yahuwah in all things and never use patterns from pagan customs. So we don't want to do this to worship Yahuwah either. We don't want to learn the practices of the heathen. The sorrows of those who run after another one are increased. I would not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor take up their names on my lips. Here's a little uh, bunny rabbit here juggling some eggs. That's rebellion too. Deuteronomy 12, we can't leave this out. This is really pertinent. Guard and obey all these words which I command you, that it might be well with you and your children after you forever, when you do what is good and right in the eyes of Yahuwah your Elohim, when Yahuwah your Elohim does cut off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, guard yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire about their mighty ones, saying, How did these nations serve their mighty ones? And let me do so too. 
Do not do so to Yahuwah, your Elohim. For every abomination which Yahuwah hates, they have done to their mighty ones. For they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their mighty ones. All the words I am commanding you, guard to do it. Do not add to it, nor take away from it. Now, when this building was built, the mayor of this city did something, and I had no idea of what it was at the time. Okay? This is really, really serious. We're going to do something right now to break a spell that was cast upon this building. Are you with me on that? Yes. Okay. Now, may all the words spoken upon this building by others be rebuked in the mighty name of Yahushua HaMashiach of Nazareth. And may his shalom dwell upon it always. Now, why do we do that? Because this is what happened. What is this red ribbon and scissors all about that we see when a building is dedicated? Well, a ribbon cutting ceremony is a public ceremony to inaugurate the opening of a new building or business. A ceremonial red ribbon is tied across the main entrance of the building, which is then cut in a ritual manner by a dignitary to declare the, op the building open for business. Pagan custom, a ruler would be the first to sleep with a new bride before her new husband. This was an honor bestowed upon that ruler. We have a Greek deity named H-Y-M-E-N, and it is the uh, name given to the deity of weddings. Okay, Eliyahu's message in the last days comes to expose the witchcraft and return to the Torah of Moshe. Eliyahu, is, his message is going forth. I don't want to pretend to be any one person. I just want to say that I want to carry that message, though. And I think a lot of people are carrying the message of Eliyahu. Dude, you're not obeying Torah. <laughs> you know, you've married a witch. Come out of her, my people, that you not share in her sins and receive the, the, the penalties of those sins. Now, anyway, Revelation tw uh, t chapter 2 is very interesting because this is spoken to the assembly at Thyatira. But, but I hold against you that you allow that woman, Izzy girl, C-H-U-R-C-H, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and lead my servants astray, to commit whoring and to eat food offered to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her whoring as she, and she did not repent. Okay? We're calling to, the, to these people that are in the assemblies to come out of her. Her is the witch. You know, the teachings of the the same thing that happened in the garden. You know, eat this fruit. This is going to make you happy and make you even happier. Revelation 17 talks about this woman. And the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup filled with abominations. Those are teachings. And the filthiness of her whoring and upon her forehead a name written, a secret, a mystery. Babel the Great. A pattern of Babel. The mother of, of the whores and of the abominations of the earth. Now there's a golden cup. This is an illustration, of course, but, you know, that's what we're looking at, you know. Now we of the covenant call to those who sit in darkness from the prison house. They're in prison because they've got witchcraft going on. Now you've got, in Catholicism, you've got seven sacraments that are administrated by the priesthood. Well, that's witchcraft. Those sacraments are not real. They don't even exist. And that's the whole reason that the priesthood exists, is to implement those sacraments. Is that, are those warlocks? Yes, call them what they are. But not the individual men. The men are deceived. Well, I hope they are. Now, Yeshayahu, the prophet Isaiah, says in chapter 42, 
I, Yahuwah, have called you in righteousness, and I, hold, and I take hold of your hand and guard you and give you for a covenant to a people, for a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes and to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am Yahuwah. That is my name, and my esteem I do not give to another, nor my praise to idols. So witchcraft, or sorcery, Kashaf has concealed itself in the most cherished of places by misdirection. Look over here while I do this. It's identified by the name of a witch, the Greek drug sorceress, C-I-R-C-E, C-H-U-R-C-H, making the nations drunk with the wine in her golden cup. And let's not leave out Yermiyahu or Jeremiah 16. See, I am sending for many fishermen, declares Yahuwah, and they shall fish them. And after that, I shall send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain, every, that means nation, and every hill, and out of the holes of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways, and they have not been hidden from my face, nor have their, has their crookednesses been hidden from my eyes. At, and first I shall repay double for their crookedness and their sin, because they have defiled my land with the dead bodies of their disgusting matters and have filled my inheritance with their abominations. O Yahuwah, my strength and my stronghold and my refuge, in the day of distress, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited only falsehood, futility, and there is no value in them. Would a man make mighty ones for himself, which are not mighty ones? Therefore, see, I am causing them to know. This time I cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is Yahuwah. Not the Lord. Not the Lord. That's a Hebrew word for B-A-A-L. Now, a, a distinction is going to be made between the righteous and the unrighteous. Malachi 3 is talking about Eliyahu. Then shall those who fear Yahuwah speak to one another, and Yahuwah listen and hear, and a book of remembrance be written before him of those who fear Yahuwah and those who think upon his name. And they shall be mine, said Yahuwah of hosts, on the day that I prepare a treasured possession. And I shall spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again see the difference between the righteous and the wrong, between one who serves Elohim and one who does not serve him. So the primary message of, of Eliyahu is mentioned here too. The messenger that was a, an angel that was sent to John the Baptist's father, his name was Zechariah, about his coming prophet, which is his son. Luke 1 says, and he, that's, that's uh, John the Baptist, as they call him, or Yahukanan, and he shall turn many of the children of Israel to Yahuwah, their Elohim, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Eliyahu to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the insight of the righteous. Now that's from two different places, Malachi and Daniel, to make ready a people prepared for Yahuwah. Malachi 4 says, Remember the Torah of, of, of Moshe, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Yisrael, laws and right rulings. See, I am sending you Eliyahu the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahuwah. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with utter destruction. So remember that misdirection is deception. So beware of it. Ephesians 5 says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these the wrath of Elohim comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partakers with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Master. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is well-pleasing to the Master, and have no fellowship with the fruitless works of darkness, but rather reprove them, expose them. 
So when your parents accuse you of lying to them, just look at them in the eye and say, you know, E-A-S-T-E-R, bunny, Santa Claus, tooth fairy. In uh, first Yahukana, or first John chapter 3, it says, Everyone doing sin also does lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Everyone staying in him does not sin. Everyone sinning has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one lead you astray. The one doing righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. The one doing sin is of the devil, because the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of Elohim was manifested, to destroy the works of the devil. So that's what we've been talking about here, the works of the devil. And they're hiding in plain sight. They're trying to be masquerading in, in uh, costumes or in, in a place where you least expect it. And we're just pointing it out. And our commission with, that was given to us as Nazarene to guard his Torah, his Ten Commandments, and his name. Here it is, Matthew 28. Therefore go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the set-apart Spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. So we teach them the name and we teach them the Torah. And we're saying now today, Baruch Haba Bashem Yahuwah. That's blessed is the one who comes in the name of Yahuwah. So that's uh, the end of the seminar. Well, thank you all for coming the distances that you've come. Thank you very much. When I